Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, AmTrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsinelli, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Marinkoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Last week, we learned about the kid from Bensonhurst, okay? You know, the kid from Bay Parkway, you know, who went, whose head now has three degrees, NIH, a couple of books, and all of a sudden, there's the story that he failed to tell me about how he met Gallo. You were right, you were working for an Italian newspaper? Yeah, my brother John, right, uh, who was kind enough to co-author the Dinner with DiMaggio book with me. John and I wrote for a, an Italian-American newspaper called Legenda. And one of the people we were going to interview was Bill Gallo. Now, was this when you were in high school? Or? This is when we were like be, be, end of high school, beginning of college. Johnny was already at Long Island University in college. I was still, I believe, finishing up right. high school or maybe my first year at New York University. And we were going to interview this great Italian-American by the name of Bill Gallo the world's famous sports cartoonist, sports writer for the New York Daily News. So John and I show up to Bill's, Bill's office, and we were so delighted and honored to meet him. And we go through this whole interview with him, asking him about his career, the GI Bill. He went to Columbia University. I mean, Bill was an amazing, amazingly brilliant person in so many ways. And then he says, listen, kids, I, I hate to tell you this. I have some bad news for you. So John and I look at each other like, what could be bad news? You just gave us a great interview. He goes, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm not Italian. <laughs> but Spain and Italy is not that far away from me. <laughs> but, okay. but he says he was Spanish. So I said, oh, my goodness, Mr. Gallo. He goes, no, no, it's okay. He says, you could, you, know, you could still do the interview. And he got such a kick out of that that he, he took a liking to John and me. And, and we became friendly you know, on, a, on a social bi- in a basis after that interview which means we would drop by to see Bill. We'd watch him do his caricatures of the week. Uh, we'd have coffee with him. And it, it really started a, a fantastic so, so, relationship. So what does Bill do one day? He has a friend by the name of Joe DiMaggio? Yeah. I mean, Joe DiMaggio was very, very careful about any journalist that he would be, befriend. I mean, his two favorite was Bill Gallo from the New York Daily News and Dave Anderson from the New York Times. He trusted these people uh, to the end, nth degree. You know, he would always tell me, you know, Doc, when you tell Gallo something is off the record, 
it's off the record, which, as I learned later on, was a big deal when you're dealing with journalists. So one day, uh, Joe DiMaggio is having lunch with Bill Gallo, and he starts to complain to Bill about his heel. Now, the famous heel spur injury that was world-renowned, chronicled in The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, the, the, probably the most famous sports medicine injury ever. As you know, DiMaggio had his heel spur surgery that didn't go very well, which pretty much curtailed his career. So Joe was complaining to Bill at that time that his heel was starting to bother him again. And Joe, you, Joe used to love to walk, Michael, loved to walk, loved to golf. So Bill says, you know what, Joe? I said, I may have a guy I like you to see. I mean, he's a good guy. He's a street boy, he grew up in Brooklyn, did his training at Yale, and he did his whole basis of study based on treating people with musculoskeletal problems involving the foot and the ankle in a non-surgical way. He may be able to help you. So Joe at the time, from what Bill told me, was a little skeptical. He says, okay, Bill, give it a try. So a day later, Bill Gallo calls me. He says, Rock, I want you to drop a line to somebody, a friend of mine, who has a problem with his heel. I said, okay. Is this this when you're working in the... uh, At the New York College. No, no, you're at the New York College and the end of Dante's office? Right. Well, no, actually, I had had graduated to 860 on East 68. So you had moved up. And I said, okay, Bill, well, what's his name? And he says, Joe DiMaggio. I says, Joe DiMaggio? I said, are you kidding me? I said, you know, Bill, I says, his heel spur. He goes, goes, Rock, I know. His heel spur injury is world-renowned. He goes, just drop him a note. You know, by, by amazing coincidence, he happened to be residing inside the building that my practice was in. So it couldn't have been any easier. So I drop him a little note. Mr. DiMaggio, you know, our mutual friend Bill Gallo, asked I drop you this note. Uh, Please feel free if you ever want to you know, drop by and say hello. So I give it to the doorman, never, ever, ever expecting any response. Later that night, around 7 o'clock, uh, my first office manager was a great kid by the name of Christine Albano. Christine calls me in the back. She goes, Rock, you're not going to believe this, but I think Joe DiMaggio is here inside the waiting room, and he wants to talk to you. So I says, no, Christine, it probably is him. So, of course, I, I put my lab coat on. I run out into the waiting room, and there's Joe DiMaggio, impeccably dressed, looked like an Adonis. He's Perf- there with his friend, who Rick- used to own the place in Atlantic right. City. Dick Burke, who's a wonderful human being. Uh, and they're, they're, both of them are standing there, but I'm looking at Joe, impeccably dressed, not a hair out of place, tie, perfect knot, shoes. You could shine a mirror off of his shoes. And he says, hi, Dr. Positano. I'm Mr. DiMaggio. This is my dear friend, Mr. Burke. And... I was told to come by. Maybe you can give me some you know, assistance with this problem I've had. So, of course, I knew what the problem was because everyone knew what Joe DiMaggio's issue was. So, bottom line, fast forward, about three or four months later, we did a special uh, technique for him at the time where we were able to strap his foot in a way, support his foot in a way orthopedically where the heel spur issue was no longer an issue. So, I figured, okay, can't get any better than this. We just took care of the Yankee Clipper got his famous heel spur uh, injury under control. I'll never see him again. How nice was this, you know? What a great. So a couple of months go by, and one day, the bell rings around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then Christine Albano says, Rock, Mr. DiMaggio's back. And I said, oh, my goodness, Michael. I said, oh, he probably is hurting again. Oh, goodness. So I, all of these thoughts went through my mind. So I walk up front, and I says, hi, Mr. DiMaggio. He goes, hey, Dr. Positano. He goes like this. He goes, hey, kid, why don't we go grab a cup of coffee? So you go to Madison Avenue at 67th Street? Literally, we go to Gardenia. Uh, great, as you remember, a great restaurant, a great, you know, upscale place to have coffee and breakfast. And from there, things started. And I realized at that point that, you know, Joe was interested in also being, you know, not just a, an ex-patient, because our doctor-patient relationship was now over, because he was cured, thank goodness. But he got a kick out of hanging out, I guess, with us. And, th- and the rest was history. So... Let's, let's talk about that doctor-patient relationship, which became more of a friendship. He said Joe was very prim and proper. It, it took a long time before him, for him to call you Rock. It was always Dr. Positano, and you had to call Mr. DiMaggio? Yeah, it went on for a while. It was interesting. He would call me Doc, and I would call him Mr. DiMaggio. Uh, but after about two years, one night we were, we were having uh, dinner, and he says, you know, Doc, just call me Joe. And then I said, oh, my goodness, 
Uh, you finally, you, you, you pass sainthood. I pa yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, I just got the golden pass. And from that point on, I would call him Joe. Now, you said at that time, Joe, uh, or Mr. DiMaggio, I don't want to be inappropriate, lived in San Francisco, he lived in Florida, and he lived in New York. And he came up for about 15 days a month or something like yeah, that? Yeah, he was in New York quite a bit, uh, Michael, for good reason. I mean, one of the things we mentioned in Dinner with DiMaggio was that Joe was an absolute expert on compartmentalizing his life, which means he didn't have one life. He had three lives. He had the life in San Francisco, the life in Florida, and, of course, the life that I got to know, the life in New York City, in the place where he was actually able to enjoy himself finally. Because as you could remember, Michael, when he was playing center field for the New York Yankees, it was impossible for DiMaggio to go to anywhere. He'd go to a restaurant, there would be a crowd out in the streets waiting for hours for him to come out. He couldn't go to a movie. He couldn't go to a, a, a restaurant to just relax and have a cup of coffee. But during the last nine years of his life, which is really what Dinner with DiMaggio is about, it's a snapshot of the last nine years of Joe DiMaggio's life in New York City. Now, how did he take it when you, you met with him and he said to you, who was your favorite baseball player? <laughs> and you had to tell him it was Mickey Mantle, who he really had limited respect for. Well, it was interesting because we were at Gardenia one morning and he said to me, you know, Doc, he goes, you never talked to me about baseball, which is, by the way, one of the allures, I think. The fact that I didn't know DiMaggio as a player. Did he realize that you played uh, left field uh, in Brooklyn? Well, he did. My mother made sure he knew okay. that. But that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> but <laughs> he says, you never talked to me about baseball. I said, well, Joe, you know, it's never come up. So he says to me, he was testing me. He says, so tell me, Doc. He goes, who's your favorite baseball player? So I didn't even have to think about it. I <laughs> says, Mickey Mantle. So he looks at me. He goes, that's the wrong answer. So I said, oh, boy, I'm in trouble now. So... For about two days, he was, he was a little cool with me. He didn't talk to me very much. And then he said, you know, Doc, he goes, I can see why you said Mickey Mantle. I said, yeah, Joe. I said, remember, you know, you, you last played for the New York Yankees in 1951. I wasn't born until the late 50s. I said, there's no way I could have seen you play baseball. He says, you know, Doc, you're right. I'm sorry. The only thing you really knew about, I mean, you knew about the, the Yankee Clipper and you knew about how great a player he was, but for what you and your brother John remembered, he was the Mr. Coffee in yeah. the Bowery Savings Bank. <laughs> well, that was the interesting thing about it. I mean, that's what we knew him as. Because many a Sunday dinner, Michael, when we were on Graham Avenue in Williamsburg, you know, the, the new hot, hot part of Brooklyn now, you know, over the dinner table, the, my grandfather, my uncles, uh, my cousins, they would all talk about how great DiMaggio was. Because, you know, John and I and my, my younger cousins would try to watch baseball games uh, you know, the Yankees were playing. And they say, ah, oh, you don't know anything about baseball. You never saw DiMaggio play. And every time we'd have uh, this conversation, I said, finally, I said, well, we never saw DiMaggio play, but we weren't born then. And then J my brother John would say, yeah, we only knew him for the commercials he made. You know, he was Mr. Coffee, and he used to sing off-key in the Bowery Bank commercials. You know, that was the big joke. But we didn't have that type of reverence for him uh, as everybody else did in terms of him being iconic you know, heroic, historic, you know, a legendary person in many, many people's minds. We really started at negative 10 with Joe DiMaggio. So I think that was one of the beautiful things about our relationship is that I didn't grow up with hero worship because I never watched the man play. I mean, Mickey Mantle was my hero. But you were saying in the book, you were also talking about that you would know if somebody really ever had dinner or a meal with Joe DiMaggio, basically on what they said, how he drank his coffee, and how, if he liked garlic or not in his, in his pasta. Well, that was the ultimate DiMaggio test. People say, oh yeah, I, I saw Joe DiMaggio, you know, a year ago in, in Florida. I sat down and I had a cup of cappuccino with him. I says, no, mm -mm. there's no way you sat down with Joe DiMaggio. And of course, I wouldn't tell the people to be rude, because DiMaggio would only drink his coffee one way. You know, a half a cup of decaffeinated coffee, with a half a cup of hot water on the side, and he would mix the two. And he would pour it very diligently. Very. I mean, he was like a chem Michael, he was like a chemist. I mean, people spoke about how gracious DiMaggio was when he played center field. He looked effortless when he was going for the ball. Well, he did the same thing when he used to make his coffee in the morning. It was like poetry. It was like dancing. It just very gently, meticulously placed. It was actually a pleasure to watch him mix his coffee in the morning. Now, another thing that you say is that he never would like to have dinner with other people. It, it, 
he he beat you up once time. He was angry that you invited someone to dinner for a couple. Of well, it was interesting because you know the, the whole premise of the book Dinner with DiMaggio was the fact that when DiMaggio would sit down at the dinner table, a whole different DiMaggio would show up. The personal one, the funny one, the articulate one, the inquisitive one, the warm one, the fuzzy one. And the dinner table was very sacred to the Italians, and particularly during DiMaggio's time when he was growing up. And I think in many respects, he would take his feelings to the dinner table. And of course, what made him interesting, Michael, is that he would also want to know about your life, which is what some of the stories about dinner with DiMaggio are about, which means he'd want you to open up as well. Now, it unfortunately, was a give and take. your dad had passed on by now. Yes. But there was the story that I think maybe your mom and her, uh, her friend, who, the guy from Coney Island, met with Joe one time for dinner or a meal. And one of the things that he also didn't like, especially and he had a, a business agent or executor, Morris, over there, is that he, he, anything he would sign, I think it said he had an opportunity for earning revenue. That was uh, what his business agent told him. Well, look, I mean, one of the things about the baseball uh, memorabilia business was that it's, it was a lucrative business and it still is a lucrative business. And, you know, Joe pretty much single-handedly helped us start that, that business. And one of the bat dinners that we went to, uh, I was Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams. I was their, their date for the night, pretty much to make sure they didn't get into a fight with each other. <laughs> that was the interesting thing about it, because they were still competitive 50 years after the fact they Speaking played. Speaking about that, there was Joe's other friends, the boys from Westchester. Right. There was Nat, Nat Racine and Mario Faustini. And Joe. Uh, and Joe and Johnny Arcaro, Johnny Power. So there was a, we used to call ourselves the Bat Pack because we used to all get together. You know, Sinatra had the Rat Pack and Joe had the Bat Pack. One of the things that you tried to accomplish before Joe had passed on, and very few people realized that you were responsible for arranging his funeral at St. Patrick's. Well, you know, what happened was, Michael, Joe was always concerned that when his time came, he wanted to have the right send-off. He wanted to have a send-off in New York City, and he loved St. Patrick's Cathedral. Many a Sunday, Joe would take me to St. Patrick's Cathedral to watch the Cardinals Mass, always thinking that no one would recognize him when he put his sunglasses on, which was the biggest joke in a, in a funny way. And, you know, he always had voiced his opinion that he wanted his send-off in, in New York to be something at St. Patrick's Cathedral. His actual funeral was in the area where he grew up, uh, in, the, in the Bay Area. Uh, but his memorial service which most New Yorkers had a great interest in, was to be held at St. Patrick's Cathedral, as was one of his wishes many years before. Now, also, he had a difficulty with the uh, other uh, cardinals, Fulton Sheen, right? Well, pretty much what had happened at one point, you know, Joe back in the 50s and 60s was, was so iconic to so many people. And Fulton Sheen, as you know, had a, an amazing reach. He's an amazing... He was the first televangelist. Amazing communicator. So what had happened at one point, he was concerned, and he, he, he spoke to Joe, and he said to Joe, I'd like you to come to my office. I want to talk to you about something. And the bottom line was that he said to Joe, look, you know, with Marilyn Monroe, I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have married her in the first place. And, of course, <laughs> Joe went ballistic in, in a way where, of course, he kept his cool, but he made it very clear that he wasn't happy with Fulton Sheen's suggestion, suggestion, and he just pretty much just said goodbye because he was always a gentleman and walked out of the, the residence. Now, you talk about, you and John talk about in the book that there were sacred things. You shouldn't talk about baseball, which you learned until later on. You shouldn't talk about Marilyn Monroe, and he really disliked Frank Sinatra and the Kennedys, and Clinton also. Yeah, but you know, he, the, the interesting thing about it is one of the things I wanted to point out is that through all of these conversations, I didn't always agree with Joe. So if he had a particular orientation towards someone, it didn't necessarily mean that I felt the same way. You know, I didn't dislike Clinton. No, I'm not saying you. It was his. No, but it was interesting because, you know, you know, most people to try to get on people's good side will just try to go along with the flow. But I would just sit there and listen. What about that uh, The story about the... 75th anniversary of uh, Time Magazine, the dinner. Well, 
which, my, you know, Michael, there were so many stories and subplots that night. Which one would you like me to tell you about? The one that he didn't want to sit <laughs> next to Bill Clinton. Yeah, well, what happened was, you know, it was impossible to get a, an invitation to DiMaggio to come to the time 75th anniversary uh, dinner. So Walter Isaacson at the time was the, the editor of Time. Uh, he called up Mort Zuckerman. As you know, Mort is the pre- was the president of um, Boston Properties and also the New York Daily News. He says, you know, Mort, we cannot get Mr. DiMaggio. We have tried. We've called his office in Florida. We cannot get through. So Mort says, look, you know, my friend Rocky Positano, he's with him all the time. Just give me the letter and I'll make sure he gets to him. So Mort calls me up. I says, no problem, Mort. I'll deliver it to Joe tonight. I'm going to see him. So Joe reads the letter and he says, oh, Doc, I'd love to do this. You know, he he says to me, you know, Doc, I was on the cover of Time magazine twice. So he really was jazzed by the invitation. Next day, I call up Isaacson. Isaacson's thrilled. I says, but DiMaggio says he'll only go on the one condition, that he has to sit with Henry Kissinger, because he loved Kissinger, always loved Kissinger. So I said, fine. So it was all arranged. So I figured, okay, here comes the big night. You know, I'm Joe DiMaggio's date for the, the time 75th anniversary dinner. And I get a call in the morning from Isaacson's office, and they say, listen, Rock, we have great news you and Mr. DiMaggio are going to be sitting with President Clinton tonight. And all of a sudden, what Walter could hear was silence on the other end of the phone. I says, Walter, let me, let me find out about this. So I called up Joe, and Joe went ballistic. But not because he may have disagreed or, or didn't necessarily care for the president, okay? Because Joe always had the ultimate respect for the president of the United States and the office of the president of the United States. But the bigger, the bigger, the wonderful thing here was that this was about DiMaggio's word. He gave his word that he was going, that he was going to sit with Kissinger. And this was more about that. And of course, people try to say it was a slight against the president. No, it was the fact that DiMaggio gave his word that he was going to sit with Kissinger and he wasn't going to, quote unquote, trade up his table. So the, as I was reading, rereading the book, because I've read it close to twice, how do you and your brother decide ten, on Joe's 100th and 100th birthday, right, that you were going to write the book? Well, you know, we always had a feeling that we would like to share the better sides or the lighter sides of Joe DiMaggio with the public. You know, so many books, Michael, and so many articles were written about Joe. Uh, Joe, to his own credit, had once said to me, you know, Doc, I have all of these writers and journalists writing books and stories about me when they never even had a cup of coffee with me. And actually, one of the things that Richard Ben Kramer mentions in his book is that he said this was the one part that was actually lacking in my book is that I didn't really sit down with the subject. And I think the, the, thing, the thing here was that you know, DiMaggio was such an important historic figure, such an important historic figure. And I think what happened was we realized that in the last 10 to 15 years, if you ask a 10 or a 15-year-old little leaguer right now who Joe DiMaggio is, they wouldn't know. So what we really wanted to do, the most important part of this book, was to really reintroduce Joe DiMaggio to this whole new group, this whole new generation of people, so they could appreciate his historic significance and really what he meant to America. Let's talk about you, your facility at HSS. It's called the Joe DiMaggio Foot and Ankle. Yes, it's called the Joe DiMaggio Sports Foot and Ankle Center. Many years before Joe passed away, we were having lunch at a great restaurant that unfortunately is no longer there called Bravo Johnny. And I say, you know, Joe, we really should do something that helps the people like yourself who were not given the option of having non-surgical treatment for, at that time, his heel. We should really develop a center and hopefully name it in your honor. And at that, that time, again, he gave me his blessing, which is all I needed. I mean, I, I sat down with him, like you and I are sitting here. He looked me in the eye. He says, Doc, that's a great idea. When the time comes, anything I can do to help, let me know. And he was completely sincere about that because he also believed in treating people in a way where you, w- you would limit or decrease their, likelihood, decrease their likelihood of them having a bad result. And, of course, you know, the estate was very kind. Uh, Morris Engelberg, the executive, was very kind. And to Morris's credit, he always, always took Joe's feelings into consideration when he made any decisions. And Morris was kind enough to recommend to the estate that we allow us to use Joe's name for this particular facility at the, at the hospital for special surgery. Let's talk about Rock Positano's practice today. Non-surgical, how do you look at it? Well, I think we've done a, a, some really great things, part of our center. I mean, I have two fantastic colleagues, uh, Dr. Brian Halpern and Dr. Doug Seckendorf, 
who've also devoted their professional life and practice to helping manage musculoskeletal problems without surgical intervention, which means, you know, Doug and Brian and myself, we will do everything humanly possible to avoid someone having a surgical encounter. Now, of course, we're also fair. We're also professionals. There are instances, as you can imagine, where you've tried everything non-surgically, non-operatively, and then we have to basically tell the patient, look, we've tried everything. You're an excellent surgical candidate, which means you'll probably do great. So what we've established at Hospital for Special Surgery, this group of, of Dr. Halpern, Dr. Seckendorf, and myself, is a group that primarily tries to address the, the etiology or the beginning problems that cause a, a problem uh, in a person to have either a back, a neck, a hip, you know, a shoulder, or in my case, a foot and an ankle, to pretty much identify these patients, help to get them well, help to make them strong, and then hopefully avoid surgery. And I think we've done a really great job in terms of helping people to maintain their active lifestyle. Because as you know, Michael, I mean, from people that you know as well, you've done a lot of work with the healthcare, you know, these musculoskeletal problems, they're not life-threatening, but they're lifestyle-threatening. And that's one of the things we've really focused on to help to, to spread this ethos that actually Joe DiMaggio helped us to build even before he even knew it, using his heel spur as an example to pretty much help people who have these musculoskeletal problems be involved in non-surgical programs. So now, in between of taking care of your patients, you and your brother writing this book, you just came out with, what, your eighth book or ninth book? <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's a great book. I'm very proud of this. It's called Systemic Disease Manifestations in the Foot, Ankle, and Lower Extremity. And it's a great book because it just shows you how when a person comes into your clinical setting presenting with a musculoskeletal complaint, there are many telltale signs that could actually indicate that they may have a problem elsewhere, whether it be uh, you know, neurological problems, uh, you know, digestive problems, eye problems. So in many respects, the foot and the ankle are mirrors of systemic disease. You could diagnose so many problems if you know how to examine a person's lower extremity. Now, in addition to that, you were also writing for the newspapers or in the Huffington Post, right? Well, you know, I, I haven't done much of that. I, I mean, you have so much free time. You know, you know, I used to write for the Huff Post. I loved it. I used, to wrote, I used to write for the Daily News and the New York Post. I think I'm more concerned right now on working on some research projects that I have. Um, finishing up my textbooks, which is important because I think it's important to be able right, to and educate. Right, you're also like, the vice chairman at the College of Podiatric Medicine also? Right, I'm the, I'm the deputy you're chairman saying? up at the New York College of Podiatric Medicine, which I'm very proud of as well. Which, which you're watching over the next generation of, uh, of doctors. Of foot doctors, yeah, right. which, is, which is great. So I think it's important that you have a well-rounded life. And going back to Mr. DiMaggio, I think he would have been very pleased to know that anyone that had any association with him Always, try to, always tries to do the best thing by people. So, you know, you had some good mentors in your life. Your father, your, your uncle, your mother, your brother, Joe DiMaggio, and thanks for being here today. And now you, Michael. Thanks so much. Take care.